session. First off, thank you guys so much for spending your Saturday all day with us. It's very invigorating for me as a community health physician to see so many young folks who are interested and passionate about taking your very precious time away to come engage in these very important conversations and network hopefully with people who can help you help form some more of your professional identity as you're building your careers. Um, this panel in particular is something I'm very passionate about because it deals with the concept of advocacy. So most of us have been listening today to different structures that exist that need to be uh, talked about, discussed, challenged in certain ways, and we've touched briefly in each of the sessions about what we can do to uh, better tackle some of those issues. And now we get to hear from panelists who are doing that in a very real way with both their organizations and their personal work. So I'm delighted to um, introduce our, our three panelists. We have uh, Nora Phillips, uh, Dr. Karthik um, Ramakrishnan, and Sara Dar, who are here. Um, and um, my name is Mosin Bajwa. I'm one of the uh, faculty at UCR School of Medicine in the Department of Family Medicine. My primary job is working at the UCR affiliate Family Medicine Residency Program through Riverside University Health System, where I direct our Community Health and Social Medicine Program. And as part of that, one of the initiatives that I lead is taking our resident physicians out into local high schools and as part of a curriculum focused on building health education and health advocacy. So teaching younger people how to become agents of change and advocate for healthy issues within their own communities at an upstream level, knowing that those are ultimately going to be the same folks that live, work, and play in the communities that we serve as physicians. And advocacy by itself is the most important, in my opinion, work of a family physician. Um, that's su surprisingly, perhaps to some of you, a controversial opinion within family medicine circles, that that is one of our most important tasks. And the reason I say that isn't so much because engaging in advocacy is important to improve the lives of our patients and our professions, but because it's through advocacy efforts like this that we network with the key stakeholders and partners that allow us to overcome some of these structural barriers. And we'll talk a little bit more of that throughout the panel, um, but I'd like to introduce our first speaker, um, Dr. Karthik Ramakrishnan, um, who is actually the founder of UCR's uh, Center for Social Innovation. Um, currently holds many different hats. The ones that I thought were the most fascinating were he founded a journal. Um, people can, a lot of people publish journals. He actually founded one, uh, the Journal of Race, Ethnicity, and Politics, which I think just that sentence by itself says everything you need to know about Dr. Ramakrishnan. Um, and also, he's currently directing the Inland Empire's Committee on the Census, um, so he's super busy right now. So we're very appreciative that he's taking the time out to come chat with us today. And I'm going to turn it over to him now. Thank you very much. Can y'all get the PowerPoint up? I have a PDF here. Let me try the other version. There is an animation. Yeah. It's a very subtle Ooh. animation. It's an animation. <laughs> Something crazy. But while that comes up, let me um, uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, so uh, what I'll be talking about today is um, is a framework that, that we uh, created here at UCR. Uh, and it was one of these things, you know, one thing I'll, it's great to see everyone out here, by the way. And one thing I'll say about, um, but there's so many amazing things about being at UCR. One of the things I think that it's actually easier to innovate at UCR um, because it's not as crowded uh, in terms of all of these gatekeepers and stakeholders that might kind of, uh, you know, block your way in terms of trying new things. Uh, and we've found that uh, in the work that we do uh, at the Center for Social Innovation. How many people have heard of the Center for Social Innovation? Just by a show of hands. So hopefully you'll be hearing and knowing a lot more about what we do. We're only about two years old. Uh, most of the work we do is actually out in the community. Um, but we are getting uh, more prominently engaged at UCR with UCR Counts, which is the census effort here um, at UCR. When you looked at the 2010 census, uh, and you look at Riverside County, one of the places that actually had the um, lowest uh, response rates were the census tracts immediately surrounding UCR. Um, and it's not because we're all slackers here. Part of the problem is um, students get genuinely confused in terms of whether they should be filling out the census based on where they're, where they're staying, um, as opposed to being listed under their parents' name, right, if, uh, if, they, if they have a place uh, where they would normally reside. The answer is you need to get counted where you are on April 1st, right, kind of where that normally would be. So if it happens to be in one of these apartment buildings near UCR, you need to be counted there. 
you're not automatically going to be counted by UCL. Okay. Um, we can just go, okay, the PowerPoint is up. Okay, so while, while that's loading up, I'll just say, so our center, um, you know, we believe in the strength of the community, um, and we're engaged in various projects to, um, to be as, in as much partner, partnership with community as possible, but also recognizing our privilege and also what we can bring to bear in terms of research that can not only validate, but help advance what uh, different community priorities are. Um, and the framework that I'm going to be talking about uh, a lot today is DNA. This is something that we uh, cooked up while at, you know, while at UCR a couple of years ago. And DNA stands for Data, Narrative, and Action. I run a website called API Data, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, so when I go around the country, people are always ask me, like, you know, do you have the latest data? What's going on? You know, like, thinking that data and research in and itself will be empowering. Um, but data is just one piece. We think it's important to also have narrative as well as action. So, um, yeah, this is great. Thank you. In terms of um, why do we call ourselves a center for social innovation? So one major reason, uh, a lot of the work we do, we try to have narrative and framing like every step of the way. Part of the way I caught that bug is we, uh, a book that I wrote recently with colleagues uh, here at UCR called Framing Immigrants. And once you kind of get the full scope of all of the powerful rhetorical tools that ad makers and political campaigns have when they think about framing, it's just hard not to try to implement that in the work that you do. And that really was part of why we called ourselves the Center for Social Innovation. One of the things I do when I throw up a map, and you ask most people, where is innovation happening in California? Drop some pins on a map. Most likely, they're going to drop those pins up and down the coast, right? Bay Area for high tech, infotech, web 2.0, 3.0, whatever's going on there. Uh, there's also biotech up there in the Bay Area. There's biotech down in San Diego, biotech beach, entertainment tech in LA, a lot of tech in um, Irvine as well. So first of all, people conflate innovation and technology, and it's not necessarily the same thing. And on top of that, they'll only think about coastal California. By contrast, when they think about inland California, not just inland empire, when you look at Central Valley, innovation is not the top adjective that comes to mind. Right? Most likely you will hear words like problems, you'll hear words like struggle, corruption, poverty, challenge. This is not to say that these things don't exist in the coast, but that's not the dominant uh, adjectives that come to mind when people think about innovation, when they think about economic development. So big reason why we call ourselves the Center for Social Innovation is to reinforce this notion that innovation is happening in the Inland Empire, innovation is happening in the Central Valley. And we've been doing a lot. It's not just talk. We've been uh, mobilizing creatively um, and getting the state, including the governor's office, to pay a lot of attention to Inland California uh, and not just coastal California. Um, you can find on our website in terms of our mission and goals. Um, and I'll just say a little bit about this DNA framework. So while we were doing our work, um, you know, while we were uh, trying to figure out, one of the programs we wanted to do was the Summer Leadership Institute for Nonprofits. Initially, we were just going to do it as a um, intro to nonprofit capacity building. And someone told us, well, we don't want any intro because there's enough nonprofit capacity builders. Why don't you draw on your expertise and what you're good at? In some ways, it was kind of a, a mirror back to us because we believe in the power of asset-based narratives as opposed to deficit-based narratives. How many people have heard about asset-based narratives before? It's really powerful. Now, I have little kids, and I try to do that as much as possible when I talk to them. Instead of focusing on what they're not good at, focus on what their strengths are and try to nurture those strengths. Right? Um, often in our region, we don't do that. We focus on all the things we lack, even when we're trying to get investments. Right? So we thought that it was important to, to, to do that shift. And here was, a, was someone at the Community Foundation saying, instead of just thinking that you're a novice when it comes to nonprofit capacity building, I'm, I, I don't have expertise in nonprofit capacity building. They said, why don't you just focus on what you're good at? You're good at data. Why don't you do something about trying to upgrade the data skills of the nonprofits in our region? And so we said, sure, we can do that. But importantly, we've been doing a lot of work on framing and messaging, so we knew that we, needed to, we wanted to bring narrative in there. We also do a lot of work on civic engagement. 
So one way to capture all of that is this very simple framework, which is DNA. I should not be talking to a medical audience, talking, asking people what their DNA is. Right? We're not telling people to get a 23andMe testing kit. Right? There's all sorts of issues. Uh, I, I will never get a DNA test. I don't think I will do this. Um, <laughs> I still, you know, I, there's just too many data privacy issues. I just don't trust it. Um, but D stands for data, N stands for narrative change, and A stands for action. And so when we ask people what's your DNA, we want to know what is your data plan, what is your narrative plan, and what is your action plan. Um, we're not going to have too much time to go into it. Um, happy to, uh, we might re-up this as a workshop again uh, later on this year or the, or the summer. But data. Couple of things. One, we think of data as numbers, but it doesn't have to be. There's a lot of qualitative data. We also think data are just facts. But when you actually look at the Webster definition, it says things known or assumed as facts. So already you see how important perception is. And this is so vital, even things in science where we have 95%, 99%, 100% consensus on issues, doesn't mean that it will be received as fact, as scientific uh, wisdom that is seen as legitimate. Right? So it's important to pay attention to that. Um, increasingly, visualization is important. This is kind of uh, depressing to me as, you know, as a PhD. My dissertation, I think, was like 350 pages. I worked at a think tank before coming to UCR. I remember my second report, the draft was 200 pages, and they said, you're going to have to cut 100 pages out of that report. It was a very heavy on qualitative data, and that was painful. By the time I left PPIC, they said, we only aim for 25 pages for your reports. We continue to put out a lot of reports. What we find is that most people don't download and read the report. Most people look at the blog post or the infographics that we produce. Right? In fact, the graphic and the headline is going to have a lot more impact than even the blog post itself. We tried our hand at creating an infographic video. We spent a lot of time doing it. And we found that after about eight seconds, people started dropping. So you have about eight seconds to capture someone's imagination and deliver the key message that you want to deliver. This at least is for a broad audience. Expert audiences, legislative staff, of course, are going to download and read the report, ask a detailed question. So you need to have that as a backup, too. Next, in terms of narrative, a lot of people talk about messaging. But there's a lot deeper work than that. Um, and, and again, I could teach an entire class on framing and messaging. But the key idea here is that. There's a lot of science behind it. Uh, when it comes to framing and messaging, what a lot of times advocacy groups don't realize that it's in a competitive context. So you hire a PR firm or a messaging firm that says, go with this message, it will persuade the most people. Well, guess what? The opposition is probably pretty sophisticated, too. Um, and so you need to be able to think about messaging in a competitive environment. In the book Framing Immigrants, we looked at the effective use of Amnesty, quote unquote, is a very effective strategy that conservatives have used to try to kill any attempt at immigration reform. They've done it time and again. And even on something that doesn't even look anything like amnesty, like DACA, like the DREAM Act, um, that word gets trotted around. And it often is used very effectively to signal to fellow conservatives that they need to kill whatever proposed legislation needs to happen. On the flip side, for pro-immigrant forces, talking about children is very effective. Just in general, if you can talk about vulnerable populations, and especially children, and how policies would benefit them or harm them, it makes a huge difference. This is why child separation on the border has captured the imagination in a way that other immigrant rights issues do not. Um, also talking about how long people have stayed in the US. That, we found, makes a huge difference, but advocates have not been using that. By contrast, there's a lot of focus among advocates on whether the word it should be illegal or undocumented or unauthorized. We found that that has almost no impact on public opinion. Because if you call someone undocumented, if you're opposed to immigration, you know exactly who you're talking about. It's not revealing any new information to the person. It only signals what side of the political eye you are. Finally, in terms of action, um, it's important not only to have a, a very solid data uh, strategy plan and a narrative strategy plan, but it all needs to be connected to strategic action. Who's your audience? Who are you trying to move? Right? This is different from the kind of advice I would give to a, a PhD student. Because we say, okay, you want to find out what is an interesting research question and contribute to that. 
For most organizations and advocates, these are not interesting research questions. There's a particular thing you need to have, you have happen, either in terms of uh, getting the attention of funders and, and attracting investments, or trying to move policy. So once you decide what that is, then figure out what is the most compelling data and the narrative strategy to make it happen. We've done that here in some ways. Um, one example is the State of Immigrants Report in the Inland Empire. I'll just say a couple of quick things. Because of the relationships that we've built with um, reporters uh, over the years, not only did we release this report, it, it covered two-thirds of the front page of the press conference. And if you know anything about the Southern California News Group, they pretty much own all of the newspapers in the western part of the Inland Empire, and we got wall-to-wall -wall coverage. Right? Now, I get coverage in places like the Washington Post, New York Times, and elsewhere, but this was huge. To be able to shape people's perceptions at a local level in terms of how they should be thinking about immigrant populations. Now, it wasn't, partly it was luck. The reason why we got this kind of coverage, this was during all of the opposition to SB 54 uh, in a lot of conservative cities. SB 54 was a so-called state sanctuary law. In a lot of conservative cities, that were filing either lawsuits or opposition to this law. So what we did is dramatically try to change that narrative, to not focus on the legality and illegality, but on the contributions of immigrants to this region. We do that work with API data at a national scale, and what we try to do is to present data and research in a very accessible way. So this started in 2013, and I'm proud to say that, you know, it's, it used to be just me and a grad student at UCR. Now it's me and two graduate students at UCR. <laughs> and a couple of other faculty friends of mine in the East Coast. And we pretty much dominate news coverage nationally whenever people talk about data and research on Asian Americans. Right? So there are Asian American studies programs that have five, six times the faculty that we do, and we beat them. It's a good thing for UCR, right? Like they so were much way above our weight. We've also created a site called Racial Data, you, you know, drawing on collaborations with student programs here at UCR. In fact, we're going to have a launch of this, a public launch of this on April 7th. So save the date on that. It's amazing. When we talk about the diversity of UCR, we actually harness the expertise and diversity of our student program directors and students working in these various student programs uh, to create a national resource. This is just our data tools that we encourage people to play around with, to download data at different scales. But we have key uh, reports and findings on different communities of color uh, on that website. We influence, like I said, nationally. Uh, when it came to crazy rich Asians, our research and perspective of inequality and the need to disaggregate within the Asian American community uh, was important. When it comes to the undocumented, um, we there are members of Congress now that use that factoid that we put out, which is that one out of every seven Asian immigrants is undocumented. How many people knew that before coming in here today? All right, so now you know. Right? And this shows you how powerful this issue plays within our communities. Most Asian... Oh, I, I'm too close to that. Most, most, uh, most Asian Americans don't even know that, right? And in fact, this is so powerful when you tell people this. Uh, when, when it came to DACA, Chinese immigrants were one of the populations that, uh, that, that had relatively high rates of qualification for DACA. But very few people applied because of the false narratives within our communities in terms of who the undocumented are. Right? The undocumented Indian population is growing dramatically now. Over a half million Indian immigrants in this country are undocumented. But President Trump had a rally last year railing on undocumented immigrants in front of an Indian American audience and everyone was just eating it up. <laughs> Right? Because, I mean, and this is, this is where data, it's not just data, but how you deploy data for narrative and strategic action, that it's important. So when I talk to reporters and they say, yeah, it seems like there's a lot of anti-immigrant opinion in the Indian community, we actually have public opinion data on that to say, no, that's not true. It might be true among Trump supporters, but it's not true among the Indian American population. So these are some of the ways in which uh, data and narrative action are important. We're not going to have too much time because uh, I want to be respectful of other folks' time. But there's a lot of work being done. I'll just end with a couple of things. A couple of key lessons is that it's important to create a positive echo chamber. So when it comes to narrative work and strategic action, it is very difficult for one advocacy group to do this all by itself. So we need to team up, and we rely on the power of community. 
especially the AAPI community, to be able to change national narratives. So that undocumented figure that you saw, very simple stick figure infographics. This, I mean, it's, it's really in some ways dumbing it down. It's kind of crazy, right? There's like no advanced statistics involved in this at all. It's literally drawing stick figures. But with the power of community and creating that positive echo chamber, within two days I had an interview with NPR Weekend Edition to talk about the Asian undocumented population and why it's not part of the conversation. So there are some important lessons here, right? So it's not just about research and scientific knowledge, narrative and action are critical, and policy and public engagement entails relationship building. Finally, I'll just talk about new work that that'll be coming out later this year. And this is to completely transform our notion of what citizenship is. So a lot of us think about citizenship as only occurring at the national level. And we think of citizenship as synonymous with legal status. And what we argue is that both of those things are not true. So first of all, that California has a form of state citizenship, especially when we talk about our undocumented immigrant population. We've done immigration reform in California. There's still a lot more room to go, uh, but no, most people don't recognize that, and it's important to recognize that. And then finally, it's also important to think about citizenship as beyond legal status. So we talk about some fundamental rights, and I think for an audience like this, I'll just lift one of those rights. People talk about whether there's a right to health care, whether there's a right to shelter, whether there's a right to K through 12 education. We put that all under one bundle where we say there is a fundamental right to develop human capital. And that's where healthcare comes in. Um, because we're talking about people having a fundamental right for the essential building blocks in order to thrive, in order to live up to their full potential. So watch out for that book. Uh, it'll be coming out in September. And happy to talk more. Wow, that was fantastic. Thank you so much, Dr. Ramakrishnan, for those words and for kicking off our discussion about advocacy and action. You can see how powerful it is to have experts in the space giving us an idea of what they're actually doing and how we can frame some of the narratives, especially in this time of misinformation, to change some of that, that dialogue towards the advocacy work that we're collectively, hopefully, working towards. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Sara Dar who is the Director of Health Policy for the California Immigration Policy Center, and also has done work as a community organizer in the Midwest, in Chicago, and I believe also in Minnesota, is that correct? And, um, and also um, was very integral in incorporating many facets of the outreach component of the Affordable Care Act when that was being implemented in different subpopulations, such as um, the American Muslim Physician Network as well. So another expert in this space, and I'm happy to turn over the mic over to her now. Okay, stand here. Sure. Okay, yeah. just because I have, uh, I don't have slides, um, I have a very boring laundry list of bills that I want to talk to you guys about and I need to look at it. Um, so I'm Sara, I work with the California Immigrant Policy Center or CIPC, um, and you all probably remember uh, January of 20, 2017 with the new presidential administration freshly coming into office, or maybe you don't remember, um, the immigrant rights community certainly remembers the president um, signing off on a bunch of executive orders back to back right when he got into office within that first month or so. A number of them having to do with things like the travel ban on several Muslim majority countries, um, two of them having to do with immigration enforcement, one of them having to do with ramping up immigration enforcement in the interior of the United States. Those are things that um, that California does not have jurisdiction over, you know, how we how we enforce our immigration laws and who gets what status, like the state can't can't change those things. So we at CIPC are working on actually I love the the what you called it, state citizenship. I've never used that term, but some of the work that we're doing, I guess you could call it that. We credit you guys. <laughs> we're, we're, that's a nice that's a nice term to call it. Um, we are focused at CIPC on what can the state of California do um, to improve the lives of immigrants in this state regardless of status, um, even while we can't change you know, status itself. And there's obviously a lot of federal advocacy that's happening on things like immigration reform to make it such that people, it, it isn't such a barrier for people to get status in the first place, right? Why people are undocumented in the first place and the broken immigration system that we have is a federal issue. But in California, we've done a lot. 
before this president and after this president, actually, um, to say that regardless of status and what paperwork people have, we can do things to make sure that there's um, economic justice, that there's integration into the workforce, and that, that people have um, you know, all the things that they need to build human capital. I'm stealing a lot from Dr. Ramakrishnan right now. <laughs> um, so I want to just list a couple of bills that CIPC has worked on, and these are just bills we've worked on. There's a lot of other great advocacy organizations that have um, worked on policy um, and other issues too. But just to give you a sense of what policy can do for that translates into like the quality of human life. Um, so back in 20, 2013, we passed AB60, which is a driver's license bill. Um, probably you guys are well aware of this one, especially uh, last year with New York having a big, um, you know, a big fight over that and being successful. Um, but that bill allowed Californians um, who are residents of California to apply for a driver's license regardless of their status. And it was as simple as allowing them to provide different documents besides social security number to the DMV to prove their identity. Um, what many people don't realize, though, is that actually all immigrants in the state of California used to have access to driver's licenses regardless of status until 1994 and it was revoked. So we were actually just going back to that. Um, in 2014, we worked on SB 1159, which was um, for professional licenses. So it allowed applicants for a professional license, such as a wide variety of things from cosmetology to dental hygienists to social workers to accountants in California to, again, apply for that professional license using something besides your social security number so they could use their individual taxpayer ID number, ITIN number. And maybe I'll just define it quickly for those that may not be familiar, but there are people that can pay taxes even if they don't have a social security number, even if they don't have status, and they use a different ID number that's assigned to them by the federal government, which is called an ITIN, individual taxpayer ID number. Um, in 2015, we passed what we fondly call Health for All Kids, but it was SB 75, and this allowed low-income children in the state of California who would qualify for our Medi-Cal program, also Medicaid at the federal level, but here in California we call it Medi-Cal, um, to enroll in Medi-Cal regardless of status if they were, you know, met the income threshold. Uh, but that was for kids up to the age of 18. Um, in 2016, we passed what we call the TRUTH Act, but it was AB 2792. TRUTH stands for Transparent Review of Unjust Transfers and Holds. So again, this was really, some of these bills around immigration enforcement are really innovative because like I just said, we can't necessarily, you know, change the immigration, and, uh, immigration policy and the, the enforcement mechanisms that federal agencies use. So ICE, CBP, those are federal agencies. But what we can do is change the way our state puts resources towards supporting and, and abetting and aiding uh, those agencies and the work that they do. So the TRUTH Act, um, it required um, that local governing bodies host community forums and make public um, data pertaining to um, the local law enforcement agency's interactions with ICE. Um, so if a local you know, um, uh, sheriff's department or police department was collaborating with ICE in some way, this was a way to make that public because it varies really widely across the state and across the country, as you know, how local law enforcement decide to enter into agreements with these federal agencies to sort of help them out in different ways. So the TRUTH Act ensured that immigrants in custody of local law enforcement know their rights, it was like a guaranteed thing, and provide consent before being subject to an interview with an ICE officer, um, and then put in place processes that local law enforcement agencies had to follow when complying with a request from ICE. And I won't get into that, but there's complicated ways in which ICE can make requests of local law enforcement agencies, like, oh, you've got this person who you're holding for, you know, a criminal offense that has nothing to do with immigration. Can you transfer them over to us or let them let us know their release date, things like that? Um, this was all, you know, pre the Trump administration. And then in 2017, we passed SB 54, what we call the California Values Act. Some people call it the Sanctuary Bill, but the term sanctuary, can pe people are using it in a lot of different ways, so I try to avoid that just because it's like, which, which definition of sanctuary do you mean? Um, but it, it specifically, it prohibits local law enforcement agencies, including sheriff's de sheriff departments that control and operate local jails um, from sharing resources, so like office space or equipment or staff time uh, with those other agents, the federal agents, um, and then not complying with notification and transfer requests 
with some exceptions. There were carve outs in that bill for certain people with certain criminal records, which is, wasn't something that CICC advocated for, but ended up having, having to happen to get the bill passed. Um, in 2018, we passed the Immigrant Business Exclusion Act, AB 2184, that required cities and counties to accept, again, various forms of ID besides the social security number for people to apply for a business license. So you're someone who, you know, maybe I sell, I make food and I sell it, or I have some kind of business that I operate, have a skill that I can offer, and I wanna do business, um, and there are many people doing that, but they don't have like a certification, and they don't have just like, it's not on the book, so to speak, because it's, they're not allowed. But this changed that and allowed people to go and apply for a business license for the business that they're already doing, and that's, as you can imagine, awesome for economic development um, at the local level. And it allowed them to use their driver's license or ITIN number or municipal ID instead of a social. Um, and then last year, um, we passed um, a sort of next step to Health for All Kids um, that CFPC worked really hard on, which we called Health for All Young Adults. <laughs> um, and that extended past 18, the age of 18, but to young adults ages 19 to 25, same thing, eligible for Medi-Cal regardless of status as long as you meet the income guidelines. And um, obviously we're continuing to fight for people beyond the age of 25. These are you know, incremental steps that we've had to take because of just what was politically feasible um, in a larger vision, vision to cover all adults in California um, regardless of status. Um, and then two campaigns we're working on this year that haven't passed yet but that we're hopeful about um, are Health for All Elders and this one, the prospects look really, really good because our governor actually came out in January. At the beginning of every year, the governor puts out a proposed budget. It's not the final state budget that will pass in June, but it's, it's, it's the governor's proposal for what they want to see in the budget. And then what happens between January and June is that the governor's administration and, and the legislature, the state senate and the state assembly, basically negotiate back and forth. And advocates have a lot of influence in that as well. And then in June, we pass a final budget. And so in the governor's January proposal, um, Gavin Newsom already proposed to cover seniors ages 65 and older regardless of status um, and that really came from because people always wonder when I when I talk about that like okay yeah you did kids first and then you extended it to young adults which makes sense like someone's 18 and then they turn 19 and just lose coverage like that doesn't make sense and then and then why like the skip to elders um, and I just want to take a minute to acknowledge um, the work of we have a, a, a huge health for all coalition it's a coalition of Stakeholders, stakeholders as diverse as healthcare providers, all the way to immigrant rights activists, all the way to anti-poverty folks, and everything in between. Um, and the directly impacted, undocumented young people in that coalition are the ones who really led the charge and said, "Listen, we've been we've been around the block before. We know how this works." In the in the national debate around immigration reform, we started with comprehensive immigration reform, and what we ended up negotiating down to was DACA, right? Was, okay, maybe not everybody, but let's start with young people. And the narrative that that produced, to Dr. Ramakrishnan's point about narrative, the narrative that that produced was that, oh, the young people are really deserving. Like, we were brought here when we were too young to know any better. And, and the result then is our parents then are thrown under the bus um, and told that they are not deserving, right? That they did something wrong, um, that they are quote unquote criminals. Um, and we don't wanna see that happen again. We know that this fight for Medi-Cal in the state of California has nothing to do with comprehensive immigration reform at the federal level, but that narrative, like we see what's coming and we don't wanna do that again. And our elders are the ones who need healthcare the most. In, in many cases, they're the ones that have been here the longest. They work really hard to give us the, you know, the future opportunities that we have. And, and we don't want to start with young people anymore. We don't want to keep doing that. Can we cover our elders? And so we as a coalition took that. And CIPC, as one of the co-sponsors of the bill, we, you know, we talked to our partners at Health Access California, which is actually a health consumer advocacy organization. And we're an immigrant rights organization. And this issue is sort of a marriage between those two issues. Um, and we said, can we put together like a bill and a budget proposal that's for seniors, 65 and older, and start there? And it seemed, it seemed really difficult. I mean, as you guys can imagine, it's the population that often has the highest health need and mo costs the most per person, right, to cover. So it's asking, you know, for a bigger per capita budget ask of our state. Um, but we, we fought for it and, um, you know, there are plenty of 2018 and 2018, 2018 and 2019, we were told no. And then in 2020, the governor is saying, okay, this year might, might be the year that we can do that. So we're hopeful that we see that through the finish line um, when the budget gets signed in June. And so we're working on that. 
Um, and then the other campaign we're working on this year is the Cali ITC Inclusion of Immigrant Tax Filers, which is the AB 1593. Um, we have something called the California Earned Income Tax Credit, which is a federal one as well. And then in the state of California, you have a state earned income tax credit. So when you file your taxes, if your income is below a certain amount, and there's other ca uh, qualifications as well to be eligible, you might qualify for a, a, you know, a chunk of change, a, a bit of money back into your pocket, like a, a, ta a return that you get from, from whatever you paid in taxes that year. Put, puts money back in the pockets of low-income families. It's been proven to be one of the strongest anti-poverty tools that we have at our disposal. And guess what? People that file their taxes with an ITIN instead of the social um, are, are not eligible for it, which makes absolutely no sense. They're, they're paying their taxes and they're part of our economy. And so we are fighting to remove that exclusion this year with, um, with AB 1593. So all of that was just as giving you all a sense of, you know, the, the topic for this panel was um, something along the lines of policy and, and where policy intersects with like, like health and improving people's health. But I'm sure you can all imagine the connection between somebody um, not worrying that their parents are going to be taken out of their home, somebody being able to apply for a business license or a professional license and have that economic stability, somebody be able to get the earned income tax credit back, being able to have insurance for their kids um, and their and their you know grandparents, um, health insurance. All of that is what contributes, as you all know. I'm sure you've been learning about social determinants and engage in that conversation. These are all things that ultimately impact health. And so these are some of the ways that policy can be one lever to improve people's health. And obviously policy isn't the only lever, but that's the thing that we know best at CFPC. Um, I wanna say a little bit about narrative and what role that plays, because I, again, it's like the fourth time I'm saying, I agree with Dr. Ramakrishnan that narrative is really important. It's important to have the data, absolutely. Um, we can't get past a conversation with like the Department of Finance at the state, like if we don't have data. So of course we have to have data, we have to have numbers. Um, but narrative is really important in this debate because sometimes we encounter, so we have to go uh, around to like all of our, you know, state assembly members and state legislators, do our rounds, meet with all of them both in the Capitol and we also get members of our coalition to go meet with them in their districts. Uh, people who are their own constituents, and uh, we get people in more, con you know, conservative or like purple regions of the state who will say Democrats who will say things like, "I, I get this, and I don't, I'm not, I'm not unsupportive of health care for people, but um, it's going to be a little hard for me to vote on this because my constituency, I don't know how they feel about like undocumented immigrants and um, and and their deservingness, right, for like for something like health care, and there's just a lot of confusion." There's a lot of confusion and just misinformation about just fundamentally who are undocumented people in the state of California. And so we recognize that the narrative change around who that who that community is, is absolutely critical. Because once you once you see people as human and as like a part of our state, and yes, they are Californians, then it's a lot. Most people would actually, especially legislators in our state, would actually be fine with saying, yeah, they should get health care just like everybody else. We have programs like Medi-Cal, safety net programs, why should some Californians be left out and others? But they're not seen as Californians by some people, and that's the barrier. That's that's what will unlock that that shift in people's opinion around policies like this. Um, and so I, I'm going to give you like three or four quick factoids. Um, they are, are I have a number here: 2.9 million Californians. Maybe Dr. Ramakrishnan has something <laughs> different. I don't know because mine might be outdated. I'm just being honest. That sounds about right. Sounds about right. That's the one I have, but I've been using it since like end of 2018, I think I pulled this figure, so I should probably go back. I should use some of the tools that, that <laughs> we just saw and use those. Um, but they're, they're parents of more than one in six kids in this state. Um, there's somewhere around one in 10 or one in 11 workers in our economy. Um, they were estimated by um, the Institute for Taxation Economic Policy to pay some somewhere in the order of $3.2 billion, billion dollars a year in state and local taxes alone in California. And again, that's just what they're contributing in taxes, not to mention the contributions of people whose blood, sweat, and tears powers many industries of our, of our state's economy. So they are a critical part of our economy and our social fabric, and yet locked out of safety net programs. Um, and I want to read, so to the narrative, narrative shift piece, um, in May of 2018, when we were fighting for health for all young adults, um, uh, a colleague who works at, at the Western Center on Law and Poverty um, wrote um, a letter to the editor in the LA Times um, that's so succinct and so beautifully put that I'm just going to read it really quickly. Um, 
or read a, a bit of it, um, and she says, when we allow for an underground economy that pays immigrants less than what citizens would accept, where employers routinely fail to provide healthcare, disability insurance, or any form of retirement, and we then, in fact, collect taxes from these workers while excluding them from almost all public programs, who is footing the bill for whom? Providing basic health care by expanding Medi-Cal to low-income adults who are in the country without documents would be a, but a small reparation for decades of worker exploitation that then allows many Californians to pay for cheap goods and services without accounting for their true cost. And so I love this because she just flips the, the you guys have heard this trope, right? Whether you believe it or find it offensive or not, but you've heard this, this uh, notion put out there that, oh, these are people who are you know, coming here and taking advantage to the taker, the taker framing, right? These are people who are taking and like not contributing. And she completely flips it on his head and says, actually, there are people that are contributing tremendously, but getting paid not the same wages and not the same benefits that anyone else might get paid. And they're getting nothing back. So who's actually fitting the, the bill for whom? And so I just really appreciated that, that flipping of the narrative. Um, and we, you know, recognize that CFPC, like, there's all kinds of conversations you can have about our tax code if it's when it comes to Cali ITC or like our healthcare system and how how Medi-Cal is, you know, how that program's administered and all these other things. And yes, these are healthcare questions and tax code questions and all of that. But um, the underlying narrative shift is, I think, what's going to unlock this kind of change. And we've been doing it in California, and we're setting a model for the rest of the country um, and showing them that it works. And so. CIPC is proud to be a part of that, and I was asked to say one, th you know, something around like, what can you all, as like, I think most of you in this room are healthcare professionals. Um, what can you do? We had a campaign. Um, actually, it's ongoing. Um, how many of you have heard about public charge? Okay, so so many people in the room. The, the federal government has now started implementing a policy that affects people who are either in this country and applying to adjust status to like permanent residency. Um, or who are up at a consulate abroad applying to enter uh, for admission to enter the country. Um, but it essentially imposes a new, really rigorous test called the public charge test on these people um, that, that asks them about things like how much income they have, how much wealth they have, what assets do they have, um, are they sick, are they able to work, do they have like certain skills and certifications. Um, it's, a, it's just like raising the bar in a lot of ways, and in, included in that is have they ever had public benefits of certain kinds. Um, and we, there was a campaign, so that was a, a regulatory change. I won't describe the difference between legislation and regulation, but um, the way that the public had a chance to weigh in on that policy before it went into effect was a 60-day comment period. And there was a national campaign around this that CIPC was a part of and plenty of other organizations. And something incredibly effective and th the policy did pass, like I told you, but there was actually a very successful um, strategy to delay it from being put into, from being it being effective. It was supposed to go into effect October of last year, and it didn't until February. Um, and a lot of that had to do with the comments that people submitted during that comment period, because they're legally required. The agency that receives those comments is actually legally required to prove that any concerns about the policy or like negative side effects of the policy that are raised in those comments that come from the public, they have to be able to prove that they've addressed those or that they're not actually significant. So the stronger arguments we could put forth that this is not a good policy, that this is going to actually just make people afraid to like access health care and, and, and food stamps and other services, um, and it's going to punish people who are you know maybe unhealthy or have a disability or are low income, um, and change the face of who we allow into this country. And in that comment period, some of the most powerful, detailed, data-driven comments actually came from the healthcare provider community. I mean, and I, I can't even list all the names, but there was the American Medical Association, the American Academy of Pediatrics was like, they went way above and beyond. They submitted really substantive comments talking about when you deprive access to healthcare to young people, what does that do um, for, for them and their communities and the economy and everything. Um, but they, they, they became really active and engaged in this because they saw a clear connection between if this policy passes, it means poorer health for our patients. And they talked about it from that perspective. You know, they didn't have to get political. Um, they just they just talked about the data and like what they have expertise on, which is like the health of our patients. Um, and we know how to speak to that. And so there are opportunities where individuals like the healthcare provider community are actually really, really critical messengers around some of these policies. Um, and there are ways that you can you know, get engaged with an advocacy organization 
um, and not have to do that work full time or not, you know, that's our job. But we can tell you, like, here's the letter of support. Here's who you send it to, you know. Can you just put forth some arguments about how this is going to impact health? Um, and so there are a lot of ways that you can use your voice and, like, the expertise that you have to really make powerful arguments um, that will, you know, ultimately help improve the lives of immigrants in our state. And that's all for me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. That was that was fantastic. Your passion and expertise are clearly evident, so we're very lucky to have your remarks today. And I think that was an excellent uh, segue as well to our next speaker, because talking about what we can actually do, either as healthcare professionals or in leadership spaces in the community, advocating at the legislative level is actually incredibly important. How many people have participated in some kind of lobby day or day on the hill or legislative outreach in their organizations? Not as many as I would like to see a few, but that's something that I guarantee if you, were to, if you were to consider the different organizations that you're a part of, that exists in some way. So for example, as a member of the California, California Academy of Family Physicians, or a subset of the American Academy of Family Physicians, we participate in an all-member advocacy meeting, which is actually next weekend in Sacramento. So I'm taking three of my resident physicians and two of our medical students from UCR up to do a basically weekend of policy analysis and discussion before meeting with legislators on the subsequent Monday, and then segueing that into district level meetings. And so if you consider the impact that you can have as a healthcare professional, the work that Sara was just describing that the CIPC do, is doing, or has done, or is currently doing related to these very, very important health issues, you can have a tremendous impact by engaging those services. But you have to know what's available, and that's one of the goals of this conference, but especially this panel, is to better understand those interdiscipl interdisciplinary uh, networking opportunities and taking advantage of advantage of them as much as you can. Because if you don't leave here today with at least like 10 or 11 business cards or email addresses or phone numbers, you probably haven't taken maximum advantage of this opportunity. So um, it's, it's an important part of your training as future healthcare workers in a community space because you want to understand all the same level of information that Sarah was just describing. So before I did these things, I didn't even know what SB and AB stood for. I just thought that they were random acronyms and you know, you just hear them, you're like, oh yeah, I know what SB means. And, you know, not realizing, oh, Senate bill, assembly bill, and actually understanding the framework behind that. So that medical legal aspect is critically important, and that segues very nicely into our next speaker, Ms. Nora Phillips, who's um, the director and founder of Al Otro Lado, which is a cross-border legal partnership, um, and also directs some of the homeless integrative medical legal partnership at USC Medical Center. So we're very excited to have her presenting up here today. Um, first, for the medical providers, who's heard of Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome? Raise your hand. I've got it! That's why I'm going to be sitting down. Hypermobility, though, don't worry. Just organs will blow up, but I'm going to be okay. It's not vascular. Um, we either laugh or we die. Uh, so, is that working? I haven't been able to get it in. I think it's in Firefox if you do it in Chrome. Oh, yeah. I think now. three slides, let's go. Okay, <laughs> great, snort some coffee, let's go. Okay, so I'm Nora, I'm an attorney. I've been practicing for 13 years. Um, I went to law school in Chicago. I worked for uh, Legal Aid Chicago. I got a post-grad fellowship through Equal Justice Works focusing on the U visa for immigrant crime victims. Um, I moved to LA, I worked at the Central American Resource Center for four years, I ran the DACA program. Um, I, uh, since 2011, so I was also in private practice, but I, this is the first time in a while that I've only had one job. So um, I, f I founded Al Otro Lado in 2011 um, with a good friend of mine who's a, uh, an attorney licensed to practice in Mexico. And she was at the, there we go, does, it, does the clicker work now that we got the thingy on? Can I have the clicker? I'm gonna have to like blow through these slides. Yeah. Clicker! Thank you, sorry. Okay, so, um, thank God for PowerPoints, otherwise I would go so off track. Okay, so, my friend Esme worked at uh, Casa del Migrante, which is a huge, like, the oldest, biggest um, migrant shelter in Tijuana, and she was seeing people deported, like, within 15 minutes, and there are these, like, shell-shocked 18-year-olds that grew up in Coima, and they're like, what just happened? and you don't want to be depressed and lost in Tijuana. So um, I was like, so I'm from Wisconsin, obviously, uh, and um, <laughs> Wisconsin. Uh, 
So um, I went down. I was like, Mexico's right there. <laughs> like, it's two hours. Like, why is nobody going? Because LA County Bar Association, like, nobody was going to the border. And I was like, it's the same case. So anyway, so I did the thing. So we made the thing happen. So um, we were really angry. We started in the basement, and now we have four offices uh, in the US and Mexico, 36 staff. Um, and we started out as a project to, so everybody's talking about like, you know, the good immigrant, bad immigrant narrative. Um, I wanted to help guys, men and women who got deported out of prison. So the funding just came right in. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. It's cool though, because I'm, I'm set. I married an RN, so we're like, <laughs> I got, I, I afforded the fancy duct tape to tape my bumper off. It's, and I'm not kidding. It's okay. <laughs> so my goal is always to have like the, the, the crappiest car in the lot. Uh, so um, anyway, so we did the things. Um, and it was really hard because there was no money. We also represent um, more of the separated families than any other org by a mile. And so once family separation, zero tolerance, we've been separating families since Columbus uh, messed up and came on over. So, um, but separated in very different ways. So, um, so yeah, so one zero tolerance policy came out. It took little babies in cages for people to give a, a crap and donate. So um, my presentation sounds differently if I'm not being recorded. Uh, okay, so we've got offices everywhere. So TJ, San Diego. So TJ, we basically were the only on the ground org. Uh, so we basically run the refugee camp there. We provide all the medical, or we work with the medical providers like you, um, and we see anywhere between 50 and 100 attorneys a day, um, and we've, in like six months, gave um, like 6,000 uh, asylum seekers legal orientation and holistic care. We try to be as holistic. I was raised by two MSWs, and my husband's a nursing instructor, so I'm like a fake doctor, kind of, I pretend to be. I like to make up procedures that don't exist and make all the pediatricians laugh. Uh, anyway, so the program that I'm the most excited about is our LACUSC program in P. So I'm kind of like squatting there. Um, it's an unfunded program, and I love it. Um, does, has anyone heard of Astrid Hager? She's a nationally renowned. Yes. So she's a nationally renowned um, uh, pediatric child abuse physician who's patented different sort of scopes for doing exams, minimizing trauma. So she let me like just kind of plop on in and build an unfunded program. And so I now have 40 clients at the hospital. Um, I regularly get pulled in to consult with doctors, social workers, try to figure out public charge, public benefits eligibility, all those things. And I also represent people. So do all the things. I'm extremely tired. Okay, so this is what we do. We have a medical legal partnership. We operate a homeless immigrant services program. Everyone is, um, taught uh, how to use Narcan, because that's why I'm here. It was shot right into my umbilical cord. According to my dad, I popped up like Keith Richards. <laughs> it's okay to laugh, it's fine, I'm alive. Um, so we also do general representation and affirmative and defensive immigration relief. A lot of that's funded by California Department of Social Services, which has anywhere from like, like around 45 million a year to provide to, don't worry, I got you. Um, to <laughs> <laughs> we passed a bill together, like we're homies. I've never met her, but like, we like, legislative friends. Um, and for real, my friends that are practicing in North Carolina, Texas, like California is the only place that makes this job like remotely doable, so thank you. Um, reason number 9,000, I'm glad I don't live in the Midwest anymore. All right, so uh, representation, we do a lot of work for people detained in OTI and at Atalanta Detention Centers. We also successfully sued them for violations of trafficking and slave labor laws because you cannot force a person to do a job for a dollar a day. And that's what they're doing. That's why the profit margins are insane because they don't pay any employees. They're just like, I just can't. I'm gonna start crying. Anyway, so we sue the federal government a lot. Um, we, Miss L versus ICE was over the separated families. Adotrolado v. Wolf was the turn back policy. Uh, remain in Mexico, MPP, we just sued over that. Um, I have a lawsuit pending against Customs and Border Protection, so Phillips v. CBP uh, last, um, so 
it came out, there was somebody within Customs and Border Protection who leaked. There was an um, undercover operation, it was bilateral, between the U.S. and Mexico called Operation Secure Line, where there was a list of about 59 people, mostly journalists as well as some human rights attorneys, who were flagged and had retaliatory pa uh, passport alerts placed on their passports. So my seven-year-old and I were detained by heavily armed Mexican military after um, about a two-hour interrogation of terrorist ties, like whatever. And I'm wearing my like Ross sweatpants, <laughs> my dirty, I'm like really international, like, okay, okay. So uh, anyway, it was really horrible and super traumatic and then I got deported with my kids. So 10 hours, no med, no, no water, couldn't take any of my medication, like mega, mega PTSD on top of everything else. So they're really trying to not just go over the after the immigrants, they're trying to go after the helpers. And it's, it's, um, it, was, it was not fun. So I sued them, and I got to see them in court, and I'd been practicing my stare for 11 months, and it was very <laughs> gratifying. Um, and it's made me have, generally, are there any lawyers in the room? Great, I don't like us at all. So, um, but it really made me, I see a lot of attorneys, just like I see a lot of doctors that are not motivated by what they should be motivated by. And so, um, but this has had me, this has made me, these experiences have made, now that I need lawyers in Mexico and the US, because I see the Mexican government as well, but then some really weird stuff started going on, so my Mexican attorney was just like, you should probably drop this, I'm worried for your safety, and I'm like, okay. Um, and we have a lot of security issues. We'll have like the hand delivered death threats by the cartels for our Tijuana office because they know that there's like a bottleneck of refugees now in all the border towns because of MPP, which you should all Google, it's horrible. Um, and so it's like open season on refugees in the border towns. So we're having kids that have been kidnapped out of the shelters two, three times already. Um, we don't even blink an eye when our clients have been raped and kidnapped as long as they're alive again. We had three teenage clients last year were forced to wait on the other side and the their persecutors have followed them up from um from oh their persecutors have followed them up from um, central america and they um took three of them they stabbed two of them to death and then um and hung them and then they stabbed the third kid but he was still alive when they sent him back as a warning to the child shelter so uh it's very light Happy job. Uh, okay, so we have a border rights project, which is huge. Um, that's the one based in TJ for people headed north. Um, so we prep them on asylum law. We let them know, put like everything from like asylum. You can qualify for asylum based on persecution on account of being a member member of a political social group, nationality, religious persecution, all the like substantive law stuff. But then also the practical stuff, like put your warmest layers of clothing on the in the inside because they're going to make you take all the other stuff out, eat a big meal before you go in because you're probably not going to be fed for maybe a couple of days. Um, I mean, we're literally like taking Sharpies and writing the alien numbers of the mom on the baby's backs before they get in. It's like, yeah, it's awesome. Uh, so we do a lot of vicarious trauma work. It's just coming up in a couple of slides. Uh, so yeah, and then the deportee program. So I run that as because so, it's culturally is definitely more like an LA program. Um, I was absolutely shocked when I went to Tijuana, and I was like, I just talked to a guy who lived two blocks from me and got deported. Like what? Um, so that's run out of our LA program, um, but then coordinated on the ground by amazing staff, and we try to hire as many members of impacted communities as humanly possible. Okay, so uh, we work with like everyone, all the law schools, all the, like we got Harvard kids, we got, but like UCR is awesome. Okay, I'm just gonna say that I like it here a lot more than Westwide. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and we work with all the people in the white coats and stuff. So we're super holistic, I know I'm like, I just got a lot of slides. Okay, oh God. Okay, so I camped out at LAC USC. We do all the things. I'm at, wait, I'm, ooh, okay, time is up. <laughs> no, I can't do that. Uh, let me just, like, uh, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna summarize this. Can I have, like, just, like, 120 seconds? Is that okay? Okay, so, 
we're all messed up in the head. Immigration attorneys are committing suicide. Uh, it's gotten to the point where it's like an actual public health crisis. I'm going to be presenting at the American Public Health Association conference in October in San Francisco specifically about vicarious traumas and undiagnosed epidemic because the, fr the first responders were dying. So all of those quotes, all of those stuff in italics were quotes from my colleagues from a totally imperfect study that I conducted uh, on 145 immigration attorneys throughout the country and the words that came up more than anything were um, suicide, divorce, alcohol, like drink till I pass out. I had to do a couple of like interventions emailing uh, friends after I read their uh, responses with like um, you know referrals to like the local like suicide hotline and things like that so you're just like reading the spreadsheet and you're like oh my god that's Susan you know it's just anyway um, so we're all broken and I see a lot of the impedes it's really incredible at you I love USC or LA, I don't USC is cool, but I love LAC. <laughs> um, I wave to it from the freeway. I it's like a cathedral of like public health access. Like I want to marry that hospital. <laughs> my husband works for DHS as a nursing instructor at the nursing school, and even he thinks I'm just like he's just like you need to tone it down. Um, but I just public health infrastructure is so critical, especially in uh, communities with large numbers of immigrants. And I have so many good examples of how this can help, but. Basically, the, the components, after a lot of research, and, a, and being, I've been doing direct service with trauma survivors, uh, with immigrant trauma survivors for 20 years, and I've been an immigration attorney for 13 in very high volume. Like, the ER, legal aid is like the ER. So, um, anyway, the, the, in my opinion, the three successful components of any medical legal partnership are screening and representation. So, like, Get ready for me to cry again. I just got appointed as counsel in dependency court for a three-year-old who um, was thrown so badly that they had to do a partial removal of a skull. Uh, he's going to have permanent neuro damage. He just got off of the bed. He was in the pinky for two months, and he's in deportation proceedings. So um, anyway, so I want to try. My goal is sort of like a harm reduction approach. I want to make your life as as unhorrible as possible after I you know meet you and meet your team. Um, so I just want to do everything I can to make that little boy's life, like, better, you know? Um, anyway, sorry, <laughs> this shit's so hard. <laughs> anyway, I'm really sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Uh, so anyway, you gotta rep people, you gotta train the doctors, and you gotta train the nurses, and you definitely need to train the social workers, because the social workers are where it's at. Thank you so much. Um, and so, because of that, I end up getting pulled, but not too hard, because I don't want a subluxation. Um, I get pulled into like actual exam rooms, where people are, where initially we thought maybe it was a public benefits issue, and then we realized, like, can I tell one quick case? Okay, I'm gonna just talk really quick. Okay, a medical social worker named Brenda. She's amazing. She's at LAC USC. She's got a mom who's in the in the exam room who's got a broken leg, and she's with her kid, and she doesn't know anything about else about what's going on. So she comes in and she's like, I think they may qualify for like some sort of like like uh, cabbie cash assistance for. And I'm like, Oh no, sweetheart, this lady doesn't qualify for cabbie. Like, never, but anyway, but what's going on? And she's telling me, I'm just, and I'm like, Where is the family? And she's like, Three feet away. I'm like, I'm just gonna go in there. So we go in there. Turns out the kid. And the mom had just gotten released from the Galeras, which is the CBP temporary, Galera means icebox in Spanish, they keep them about 40 degrees. Um, they, they had just gotten released from the Galeras, kid was separated from mom, mom got pushed by the coyote, so she broke her leg. Then she gets locked up. Then the kid was 16, so he shouldn't have been alone in the Galera, but he was while they put mom in the hospital. Border Patrol at the hospital is telling her, you're a terrible mother, and we're gonna be federally charging you with negligence, which isn't a thing, um, because you brought your kid here. And so she's traumatized, hearing that as a mother is just like, <laughs> and then to the kid, they say, whose braces are literally falling out of his mouth, and he's got this gnarly, gnarly scar from when the gangs broke his arm, and he's only 15. 
And he's like, and I know they don't trust me because like some white lady with a Wisconsin accent, a graduate degree walks in, like, hey. So I, I like, I worked. I've been doing this for a really long time and trying to establish trust in a traumatic environment where you gotta be really efficient. Like I've, I've, I've been working on that for a while. So, um, and I also know exactly what they went through and the, possible, the very high likelihood that they met my staff in TJ because we're al otro lado. I came up with it. So. <laughs> anyway, so it's, 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 you know, they're like, oh, Nicole, crazy ass Nicole and TJ. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I just texted her 10 seconds ago. She's taking her puppies to the vet. They're like, oh, okay. And then our clients, you know, it's, it's, they met us there and they're meeting us here. That's when it works out really beautifully. Unfortunately, this family didn't. So all of that rambling to say that once I talk to the kid, the kid tells me that when he was separated from mom, the Border Patrol was like, if you go to the doctor for anything, we're going to know and you're going to get detained until you pay it off. So of course he doesn't want to take advantage of dental services under Medi-Cal because he thinks that he's going to be detained. So then I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm like, here's a little mini lesson about HIPAA. Let me get you oriented about court. Here's a referral list for everybody. Like, da, 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 da. And by the end of it, I walked out and they were like, so what's going on? I'm like, do we have a mental health referral for this family? And they're like, no, why? And I'm like, okay, let me tell you what happened to them. And they're like, Ugh. So now I'm doing Pete's Grand Rounds where I'm bringing in indigenous interpreters and we're talking about the journey and the condition, the pre-existing condition of colonial racist crappy foreign policy since the beginning of time that's causing some health problems. I'm sorry, I went over. There's a lot more. <laughs> sorry. Uh, I'm done, I guess. I don't want to leave this anymore. Fantastic. I'll cry so, more. So couldn't have asked for a better speaker to end with. Um, very powerful. Um, just just incredible for, from all you guys, but especially just to cap, at the end to capture some of the, the difficulty uh, working in this space, but also some of the inspiration that comes from finding where your personal work can be very, very effective. And, you know, I, do we have time for questions? Where's our, probably, take one so, so does anybody have questions from the audience for any of our panelists? Because if not, I have a question. So we're, we're in a space with mostly young folks. Um, if you can think back to perhaps when you were starting out your careers or what it was like as an undergraduate student perhaps with a drive to do something, right, a drive to change the world perhaps, was there a particular experience or a mindset or something that you felt was very impactful and got into where you are now as director, director, director of something, it's a very important role that you play now and if there's advice or something you could share about one, the feeling of what somebody can do right now in this space and also Leaning in, as they face on the precipice of their careers, what they could be doing uh, to set themselves up in the, in this, in the, to get to the space where you are now. If anybody would like to tackle that. I was always the one in law school that was like, you know, like anyone else is there, like, literally like anyone, even people that don't go here. Like, so, <laughs> um, so I had a really interesting conversation with a young man who was outside, who was an undergrad, and he was like, I don't know what I want to do, and I was like, what makes you mad? And he was like, oh. <laughs> I was like, yeah, do that. Do the thing that, you know. So for me, I was, I got my bachelor's degree in French. Um, and I was, well, my dad, which is useful. We have a lot of West African clients, a lot of Haitian clients. Um, yeah, if I spoke Swiss, it would be like, go ahead and make fun of that. Sorry, there's, anyway, I don't know much about Swiss. Either. So, uh... <laughs> But what I was going to say is that I was considering doing, my dad was just like, oh. I was like, I'm going to do my PhD in Quebecois women's studies. And he was like, just be a podiatrist. And I'm like, I can't even touch my own feet. So I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do. And then 9-11 happened. And then the Islamophobic backlash to 9-11 happened. And I was living in New York City. I was living in New York City the year after 9-11, when you guys were like being born. And um, I remember the um, Sevis, not Sevis, the NCRS program, which was where every man from certain like Muslim predominant countries between the ages from like 14 and up had to register. And you just see these lines of men. And I was like, mm, this? What can I do? And then I'm like, I'm going to go to law school because it's like a really great gun. And like, I hate the Second Amendment, but it's this like awesome, well, you get to sue the bad guys and you get your day in court 
And I just wanted to do everything I could to like, I was like, that's making me angry. And I was like, oh. So I would let anger be your guide. <laughs> yes. What, what I would say is that it's, uh, I think passion is important. You know, whatever, whatever that emotion is, um, I, and I say this to my grad students, but I'd say to undergrads for everyone, the thing that will carry you through and especially when it feels very lonely, when, it, when it, the odds seem very stacked against you, to have that passion and that sense of justice. Um, that's been true for me. I'm an, I, I should have said a couple things. I'm an immigrant myself. Uh, definitely one of the more privileged ones. My dad came in on an employment visa. Um, but you know, being an immigrant, I think, has sensitized me uh, a lot to, um, to others, not just immigrants, but even other other folks in this country um, that are that are um, you know that are, that are perpetually uh, marginalized, discounted, and kept down. So I would say we all have a lot of privilege here, and let's try to use it for good um, to try to uh, help those that, that, that haven't had the kind of advantages we have. One final thing I'll note about that that report that was important is that it was um, that State of Immigrants report was uh, was co-written with CIPC and the Inland Coalition for Immigrant Justice you'll be hearing from later today. And for that too, I would say, people look to academics for the credibility and expertise, which is great, uh, but we have to do it in partnership. Um, because if we don't, no matter how well-intentioned we are, uh, sometimes we might actually make the problem worse uh, without being attuned to our community partners. So I don't know if I'm young or old or really all that far along in my career, and I just got promoted to director like three weeks ago, so, so I don't know that I have as much wisdom to share, but yes, you do. I'll say Stop. this, about my, about my career trajectory, um, the only reason I feel confident standing in front of legislators and telling them about what's best for the lives of you know, immigrants, um, and especially immigrants without status, which is not who I am, um, is because of the years I spent at the doing grassroots work, right? Like I, I sat there and filled out applications for Medicaid for people who had com really complex immigration status. Like, well, here's my employment authorization, but what's your A number? Like, I did all of that, you know, and I I did grassroots organizing. And so it's it's to Karthik's second point: engage with impacted communities as much as you can because you'll understand things from a, a much more authentic and nuanced perspective. And it's not that people who have, you know, maybe studied a community um, don't know anything about that community, but the nuances come out in the experience of people. And it becomes a lot more layered and complex. And in, is looking and recognizing, as, as Dr. Ramakrishnan was saying, your own privilege, right? So all of us carry privilege in some way, whether we recognize it or not. And being aware of that is super important because only when you combine that with the, the amazing stories that you've heard today and put that into action will you start to see that difference in, in your communities. One of my favorite quotes from the poet Rumi was, yesterday I was clever, so I wanted to change the world. And today I'm wise, so I seek to change myself. And that really speaks to the efforts of what we're doing today to try and understand all these different domains that are in place and meet people who say, hey, I'm actually making a difference in this space. Let me talk to that person. So please, 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 Network with the people around you. If you're still sitting right now at the table with the people you came in with, you're not doing it right. So get up, switch around, find other people, meet someone who is in a completely different space, and I guarantee you'll find some commonality about which you can deconstruct and break some of these construct these systems that are in place, ultimately ending up in negative health outcomes. So um, let's give a huge, huge round of applause for our amazing panel, please. <laughs> Thank you.